Okay, well, uh, thanks everyone for coming to our uh, fourth and, and final Origins of Life seminar uh, this IAP. Uh, so uh, today's talk is a little bit different. Until now, we've uh, really mostly uh, been engaged in conversations about the origin of life from the perspective of molecular systems, be they RNA, protein, lipids, uh, really the, the physical body of the living organism. Uh, but, but today we're going to talk about something a bit different uh, with, with uh, Vlada Stemakovic, which is going to be what are the conditions on the early Earth uh, that are involved with the habitability and, and, and the, the environment under which life may originally evolve, and what are the consequences for thinking about these things in terms of not only Earth, but other planetary systems, uh, specifically Mars. Um, and uh, so I'm very happy to uh, in, in invite Vlada here today. Uh, Vlada is well known to our department, um, and he was a, I'm not going to get this right, a Swiss... National Science Foundation fellow. A Swiss national, I can't even say it. <laughs> it's, a lot, it's a lot of S and S and S, like, yeah. it sounds like S and F, but it's like, it's, it's S and SF, Swiss National Science Foundation Fellow. So, so he was that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and now he is at JPL. Um, and uh, thank you, Vlada. Also, uh, before, um, just in case people have to leave early, uh, I'd like, uh, I, I, I like to mention that if, if you're a student and you're really interested in this material, and uh, the kind of, of origins uh, work uh, that, that's going on here. Um, uh, please consider uh, two things. First of all, um, in the spring, we offer an astrobiology and origins of life course. Not this spring, but in, up, but in future springs, uh, that will uh, be offered in the EAPS program. A and also, if you're interested in questions of, of habitability, planetary science, origins of life, but perhaps you're in a different department, if you're in the biology department, or the physics department, or the math department, or whatnot, um, then you might want to consider something like an EAPS minor, where you can take courses in planetary science that um, can integrate with, with the work you're doing uh, otherwise in your department. Um, but after that pitch, uh, thanks, Lada. Thank you, Greg. Thank you very much. And, and the next pitch, if you really would like to you know, continue this research in connection with, with space missions and you know, bringing stuff to other planets and getting data back, well, consider maybe you know, exploring with JPL. And there's a lot of possibilities for you know, PhD students, for postdocs, for summer interns, whatever, in combination with MIT, with Caltech, with many universities. And it's a really fun place to be at. So thank you so much for uh, hosting me here. I'm going to talk today a bit about something different. I call it uh, the planetary battery for the origins of life. And, um, bring an example of Mars. And I'm going to tell in a bit what I really mean with that. Uh, just first want to do what people usually do at the end, but then I always forget it. So I just like to acknowledge some really great collaborators, just a few of them that really helped very much get, make this work, because it's kind of, I'm presenting you stuff that is a bit diverse uh, and has a few different aspects. Uh, Woody Fish and Louis Ward from Caltech, and Louis is now at Harvard. Uh, JPL, Michael Mishnah, University of Rome, Giuseppe Tiope, NASA Ames, Jan Blank. And uh, now let's jump straight into it. So before I talk specifically about what, you know, the things I want to tell you today, I'd just like to quickly show you the general thing that I'll try to do in the context of the origins of life and evolution of life from a planetary perspective. So when I look at a planet, like the Earth or any other planet, I try to simplify it and generalize a little bit. In a sense, I always say I don't discriminate against planets. I like all kinds of planets. You know, it can be Mars, Earth, extrasolar pla planets. I just like them very, quite much very rocky. I prefer rocky planets because I like to stand on them somehow. Uh, but generally, otherwise, if they're rocky, I'll, I'll take them. And so I'm looking at the, at the rocky planet, and I'm mostly trying to understand how heat is being transported in a rocky planet. So if there's, example, a rocky planet which has a core, a metallic core, like the Earth, and then a silicate rocky mantle, I try to understand how as a function of time heat is being transported locally in 3D, and actually in four dimensions, because I try to understand how this evolves as a function of time. And I also try to understand how the outer layers, and I imagine this is like the, the, the lithosphere, the crust in a sense, how this is deforming, how this is changing, how this is interacting with the planet interior. And that cross is so important because, you know, when you think about life and think about a cell, I know life as we know is mostly a, a boundary condition phenomena, you know, for, from a planetary perspective. It's happening in this little layer there on the surface and there's like thousands of kilometers, which is mostly not much life. But those processes or cycling mechanisms are important for maintaining life and for determining whether the surface can be a fun place to be on or not. And when I what I really model 
from a theoretical perspective, I use a lot of uh, math, a lot of physics, a lot of uh, geochemistry and thermodynamics to understand the co-evolution of the interior and the fluids within it, especially in its crossed lithosphere, in its surface, and interaction with the atmosphere. And why I do this is, I try to do this in four dimensions, so saying looking at a planet in 3D and also how it evolves through time. The reason why this is important is because when we're on our planet and we try to you know, go somewhere in a field site, we go to Northern California or to Oman and we dig into the ground or in a lake or, or take a sample from the ocean, uh, we have a, a local sample. And we have people who, you know, of us who go to the field, we know samples are very different. <laughs> When you go to place A or place B, if A is equal, equal to B or a different time, they were very different. So we have to understand how, not just spatially, but also in time, how samples, what they mean. If we take a sample somewhere, what's the planetary context? Are we maybe you know, close to a hotspot area, like you know, somewhere close to Hawaii, or are we somewhere very different? That's really important to understand, to be able to, when we get samples, try to get a more a general picture. And that's very important when you think you know, about alien worlds where we don't really have that much detail and we have to understand then how we can generalize things from local samples. Um, and that gives us this global context for the local samples, which allows us to finally get a better understanding of the processes, but also of simplifications. And for me, what's driving me mostly, this allows me to understand how, and I'm going to give some examples then later on, how a planet can energetically and chemically drive the conditions for the origins and the evolution of life. And not just how, but also where, which regions might be more favorable for specific processes. Now for Mars, and I'm going to give the example of, of Mars for a few reasons. One reason is, you're going to see later, Mars is much more boring than the Earth, which is great, so it's simpler. But also we're going to have really cool missions going to Mars, which allow us to compare things between the Earth and Mars, and therefore learn much more about the Earth and of Mars. But what is also really exciting, and I'll show you that at the end, when we think about the origins of life research and how, you know, how a planet drives life and evolution of life, we're automatically also connecting, in the case of Mars, to very practical questions. Questions like that are motivating NASA very much right now, or SpaceX, a word like ISRU, in situ re resource utilization. So people are starting thinking, what are actual resources on an alien body like Mars? Can they be used in the future? If we send humans over there, can they use something? Where should they land? Is there water? Is there methane? Can we you know, get something to, to drink? Can we have something to breathe? Can we have something to make propulsion? And ultimately, that links as well to human settlements and human exploration of a planet. So what I find so cool about this is, you know, we're thinking about like, oh, how did life start from a planetary perspective? Which planets actually enable and drive the origins of life? But also, we're ultimately connecting not just to our past, where we come from, but we're connecting to the future of the human species. And, and you know, that's something that still makes me wake up every morning, gives me goosebumps, and, and that's a good feeling. <laughs> but now, a bit more practical. What do I mean? Let's look at two examples in this talk and look specifically at what I mean when I say the planetary battery for the origins of life. Now, when we're looking at a planet, specifically Mars example, we can model the planet, how it evolves as a function of time, and I'll tell in more detail how we do that. We're looking, you know, how heat flows, how, how res surface recycling is happening, how outgassing is happening, and this allows us as an example to understand whether a planet can generate hydrogen. So whether there are processes within the planet that can, example, generate a lot of hydrogen. And we can also say, example, when we have 3D understanding or 4D understanding, when the planet could do that very effectively and where exactly. The where we can connect to observations right now, on, you know, on the Earth or Mars, and when as well, because we have also time capsules like we have in rocks. Now, hydrogen, as we know it, is, is one part of a powerful redox couple where when we think about life, I see life simply as energetics, I see as redox gradients, where we can move you know, protons and electrons all over around. And hydrogen is one very, one, at once part of the spectrum, the driver of a battery. Hydrogen is also really important uh, because it is mostly used to generate also methane. Most plants don't generate methane easily volcanically, it's actually low temperature processes, we'll look at them later on, where hydrogen is transformed into methane. And you know, from the exoplanet perspective, people are often excited about methane, 
but also careful because there can be situations where you know we have a lot of methane there's nothing to do with life uh, in some cases like some cases of Mars where we've been discussing for 10 years observations of methane and still have no actually no clue what it really means and that's a planet that's just next door so it's important to understand how these processes function to understand whether something is a biosignature or not and on the other hand we can look if a planet can generate also abiotically oxygen. And that's really interesting because, of course, also as a biosignature to understand signs of life, but also because we are starting to understand where, which planets and what kind of planets and where exactly planets can start to build up gradients, redox gradients. And that's interesting from a metabolic perspective when you think about the origin of life. So not from a kind of cellular buildup, but from the energy that's there, the resource that they needed for life to, for life to be life, to actually evolve, to thrive, to live. Now we're going to go through these three aspects, show quickly the uh, evolution model very shortly because that's really actually, the, the, this is the biggest part of the work but the most boring one. But then I'm going to jump into the hydrogen production and the oxygen production and show you specifically for Mars how we can see where oxygen can be produced and where hydrogen can be produced and what this means for the origin of life on Mars and the evolution of life on Mars. Now, Looking at the thermal evolution model first, um, normally what we do is, you know, we take a very fancy and bit, you know, sophisticated, developed, this is a nice word, uh, 2D or 3D mantle convection model where we model heat flow, we have your Stokes equations and simplification, etc. But to have a run like this for one planet for 4.5 billion years, in case of Mars, takes sometimes a few weeks to a few months. Now you can imagine where we have, you know, we have a lot of uncertainties. We, we, looking at Mars example, or the Earth, we don't really know exactly what the structure is like. We don't really know to, uh, uh, to enough detail what the thermal or transport properties are. So we have a lot of questions. We don't know how to plan to start. So we have to include all these uncertainties if, as scientists, we really want to make a conclusion which we can say, this is a robust conclusion within my you know, uncertainty space. To do that, we have to be much faster in computing the evolution of a planet. And for this, we can do one thing. We can do just like a, a one-dimensional model, make an average model of a planet. You know, we're looking at heat flow. We cut through the planet from the core to the surface. We're looking here like that's the core, this is the mantle. We're looking how heat flows through it. And we can find some scaling laws to say, you know, what does the, how does the temperature profile change as a function of time? How does heat fluxes change? But it's a 1D model. And as we said already, it's important to have a 3D understanding of a planet as a function of time. But what we can now also do, and that's a, a cool trick that really works really well for Mars, we can say, well, let's just try to cut through the planet in different radio cones. So let's treat like, you know, each line, just from the core to the surface, and then we connect those lines with each other with the right boundary conditions. And for boring planets like Mars, boring, I mean, with a very kind words, because I love Mars, find a really interesting planet, but boring planet where there's not that much tectonic processes going on as on the Earth where we have plate tectonics. It's a different kind of mode where you have a stagnant lid. So it's kind of like a plate on top of the planet that's thermally insulating it. And the biggest variation that's causing different variations in heat evolution are variations in the crust thickness. So we know on Mars how the crust thickness is varying through orbital data. And therefore we can say to some degree how actually locally heat flows are changing. And when we do this, we can run a 3D through time in like a few minutes. And now we can start including all these uncertainties that we have. And that's really cool because now we have a planned evolution model that is, you know, looks quite similar to what we do with, when we do it with a very complicated model. It takes a few months, but it runs in two minutes. And we can include all the uncertainties. And now we can start applying this to questions of biological interest. Example we're going to see later, you know, hydrogen production, oxygen production, and include all these uncertainties and look for robust results. Look for questions that might have a real definite answer in spite of the uncertainties that we carry in our models and our understanding. So this is actually a huge part of my work, how to develop these geophysical models. And I'm really happy to talk about this in great detail and send you all those papers, but I don't want to talk about this very much because that's very geophysics-y, and I want to focus more on the biological aspects. But whoever wants to speak with me about all the details of these geophysical models is more than welcome to ask me or send me an email, 
and I'll send them all the papers and answer all the questions. What I want to talk now about is the following. Let's assume we have this kind of evolutionary model and we can now you know, model how Mars or the Earth, but much easier for Mars, evolved in 3D through time and we include a lot of uncertainties. For example, we don't know exactly how the crust evolved over time. We put this in as uncertainty. We don't know exactly how initial conditions were. We include the uncertainty. And now we study how, if there are processes in combination with the plant revolution that will allow hydrogen and methane to be formed. And to do this, there's two aspects of it. And that's the two things that I'm kind of like involved it's part of my research. One thing is understanding really the evolution of Mars, so kind of like 40 generation of hydrogen and methane on Mars, locally and in time, and understanding fundamental processes. Now what I mean with that is, when we're looking at fundamental processes that generate hydrogen or methane, there's a variety. I'm going to talk just now about one, one example here. To generate hydrogen generally, um, most processes are actually low temperature processes, where we have rock, usually ultramafic rock with Iron, a lot of iron, a lot of magnesium. We need to have water. And when they interact with each other under the right temperature and pressure conditions, we can get hydrogen. It's simply a process called sabotinization. It's actually nothing else but uh, a process where we, we uh, actually uh, trans we hydrate the rock and release, transform the water into hydrogen and releasing this product, uh, oxygen, which is reacting with the rock. Um, the, the problem, however, is it's, it's not yet well understood how the kinetics of this process depends on temperature. So the rates. We know it happens. We know it happens, you know, uh, not, doesn't happen when the temperature is too hot, about, you know, something like a few hundred degrees Celsius that stops really working. We know the kinetics goes down if it's getting cooler, just typical Arrhenius law. But we don't know exactly how it depends on temperature. And that's really important because when you're looking at an evolving planet, we have to know how fast things are happening, to know how fast rocks are interacting with the water in order to be able to understand when and where and how much hydrogen has been produced. Uh, for methane production, I'm going to talk a bit more detail later, there's also an aspect where we can, through fissure drops type synthesis, generate methane and other complex uh, molecules from hydrogen, but that's even more complicated because it depends a lot on the temperature and pressure conditions and the catalysts. Now, I'm going to show you just one example and then show you how we try to understand the fundamental uh, aspects of this. Now let's assume we go to Mars now and we look just at the serpentization process. So remember we have an evolving planet and we're going to look now where in the planet are the conditions satisfied for liquid water to exist and where are the temperature and pressure conditions correct for this chemical reaction where we have olivine, uh, the right temperatures to generate hydrogen. And in this, this process is actually also releasing heat, so we have to include this self-consistently in the evolution of the planet. Uh, and it depends also on the mineralogy, on the iron to magnesium ratio, and a set on the temperature. Now what we can do is just very, very simplified to show you that as an example. We can take Mars, this is the surface, we're standing somewhere here, our heads are exploding, because we're on Mars, it's really not funny, we're not really exploding, but it's not really pleasurable. Um, so, you know, people always got some Mars, what, 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 what's, what's worse, the, you know, the, the low pressure or the, the cold? Many movies try to addressing that, how people die. It's a it's very, very interesting question to research if you want to do that. Um, but, but imagine we stand here, maybe we've kind of like protected, and this is the crust, and the crust is, thickness is varying across the planet. And we have below that mantle, which is very rich in olivine and has a specific iron to magnesium ratio. Now we can compute the zone where water could be liquid. So we're looking in our planet, you know, what is temperature, what are pressures, where, what is the porosity, where can water exist in a liquid state to compute that. And then we can say, well, where can this reaction happen? And we can find a zone, example this zone over here, where this reaction is happening. Now, there's a lot of things coming in here, but what's really important is to realize this kind of reaction doesn't really happen if the temperature is significantly larger than 300 degrees Celsius. So we can say, if this, is a, if this is like an isotherm with 300 degrees Celsius, there is no, and even if there's water down here, supercritical state, but there will be no reaction occurring. Now look at this picture quickly, please. This is time one. If we go to a later time step, the planet will cool down, and this zone will spread to the interior. So if you go back, see, earlier time, later time, we move inward. So the zone where serpentinization can occur is shifting inwards. 
This is the part of the evolutionary process where we need the kinetic aspects because we have to know how quickly is rock being serpentinized and how does it affect the thermal evolution. Once we know that, we can consistently run an evolutionary model for Mars and ask the question, where is hydrogen being formed? Now, what we can also do is we can look at data we have from Mars and say, do we have some constraints on some of those properties that will impact this evolution? So example, we have crustal thicknesses. That's an important input. Uh, we have also information on, as an example, the surface, very shallow surface distribution of radiogenic heat sources like uh, thorium and potassium and how much iron we have in minerals. But this is really very, very shallow surface information. It might be very misleading. But that's the information we have to date. Now what we can do is, we can say like, okay, let's now include, you know, the in uncertainties in an evolutionary, how the planet evolves with these crustal thickness constraints and then play around. Let's play around example with what the iron to magnesium ratio could be of the mantle or how it could vary. And let's see what we get. And I'm going to show you just one example for, for a most common case of iron to magnesium ratio assumption for Mars and, and what we get. Well, we get the following. This is a video showing how hydrogen production varies on Mars as a function of time from the formation to today. This gray zones, there's no data input in here. So this is the only zone where we get data. And this assumes actually specific things. It assumes that the, there's a local variability in iron to magnesium ratio, which we can predict based on the mineralogy. And it also assumes that there's only serpentinization happening in very, that we need to have olivine rich rocks and we're looking only at upper mantle rocks. These are very, very strong assumptions, most likely very wrong assumptions. But what I want to show you is the following. Let's just make those assumptions that many people will do. And today we get something nice. We get the prediction for today where we have large hydrogen production rates and we have low hydrogen production rates. And what's really interesting is depending on the blue and the red zones, there's differences of orders of magnitudes. So there's some zones where we can have theoretically really a lot of hydrogen produced and some almost nothing. And they're not far away from each other. But now we could say like, well, you know, dude, that's because, you know, you made weird assumptions and we're not sure these assumptions are right. That's the right attitude. That's what I want to show you is what we have to do is, you know, make other assumptions that may be reasonable or maybe even unreasonable. And what we got to do is ask ourselves the questions, is there some robust result for interesting zones and can we learn something from this? Now this is the result for the model I showed you right now. We can also do a very different model. This is now a very very different model that has very different assumptions. It assumes for example there's no iron to magnesium va uh, variation in the planet the mantle. It's all the same and it also doesn't really vary that much anymore. Um, the, it doesn't really look at, only at, at olivine but also the crust. But what we see is after 4.5 billion years, there's, there, there's a lot of differences. Like here, there's a lot of production, there's not much production here, but there's still, in both cases, and I've run like hundreds of simulations, and you can still see in all the cases, there are some zones which always stick out. Some zones where, and that's actually mostly because of the crustal variation over there, so the crust is kind of dominating the heat flow, and it shows us these are really interesting, cool zones where a lot of actually olivine-rich upper mantle rock could be serpentinized. So what this tells us is, is the approach is the following. We model with the uncertainties and we see, wow, in spite of the uncertainties, there are some interesting zones. Some zones where you can say, oh, if we think about hydrogen production, those are really worth investigating. Yes? So is the idea that the red places are where H2 production is likely? Yes, exactly. Sorry. Red places are where, yeah, please. So what, what, where does this fall within the timeline of Mars' timeline of, of the planetary evolution? So this is today now. This is a snapshot right today. Right today? Yeah. Okay. Exactly two hours ago. No, but okay. like geological age today. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so see, that's a, good, that's a very good question because one of the big uncertainties is, example, how did the lithosphere evolve? You know, because the lithosphere is a big modulation of the heat flow and we don't really know how that evolved. We have strong indication that the biggest 
uh, formation was in the first 500 million years, then it kind of stagnated. You know, later on after Tharsis, the big volcanoes formed. Uh, but we don't know that. So these are the things we include as well in the uncertainties. Because I, because I, if that map is, if, in my mind, if I see that, if I look at the map of Mars, yeah. I'm seeing the three large uh, volcano shields over in... Right here. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. See so maybe here. Wait. Oh, yeah, okay. So, so that's where they, okay. Yeah, this is nothing to do with the volcanoes. Okay. Nothing. So you see right here, Valles Marineris, here are going to be the big volcanoes, Olympus Mons over here, and the whole Tharsis region. Um, so these kind of... The, the, the zones that are really interesting here are actually Arabia Terra. And, and so that's kind of like a zone which, which is kind of fascinating to look at. Mm -hmm. And that's also interesting because when we start thinking about this region, we see what kind of, you know, we start to understand in a, a lot of, you know, a lot of factors impact, for example, hydrogen production rates. But we can see from this kind of simulations that some things don't matter that much. And that's really important. When you think about planetary science, there's going to be, you know, it's a multi-dimensional complex thing. But some things don't matter that much. And it's important to figure out what really matters. And that's, that's what we're trying to do here. Because when we know what really matters, then we can feel confident enough to say we can make predictions for weird planets, which we don't have much data. Mm -hmm. If we don't know that, then we can make any claims. That's the problem. But we can, we can. and that's what I'm showing. This is still a work in progress. I'm very, i got to emphasize that. But it's a first step of showing we can look in 3D and start understanding something about the subsurface and production. And this is so interesting because, as I already mentioned, hydrogen production is linked to methane production and also to water availability. So, which means that, you know, if we're, sorry, we go back, if we're on Mars and take data, I'll show later, we can compare this to observations, start learning about, oh, is there maybe water? Or what does it mean really for, you know, maybe methane production or methane observations if they're real? You know, we start connecting to real data. And that is the nice thing. Um, but we can also connect it to the Earth. You know, on the Earth, people have been really interested in understanding how effective is serpentinization, how effective is, you know, fissure trough synthesis. Uh, uh, you know, when we see methane, does it come from bio biological sources or is it, can it be created abiotically? And that's very important when you think about early Earth. If we want to have, you know, something eating methane and we cannot generate methane without life, eh, no, not really good to start with. You know, we can start thinking about what are the first metabolisms that would be there. But we'll see, there are processes to do that. And for the Earth example, you know, example, Barbara Sherwood Lauder made this beautiful piece of years and years of work where she, where she and her colleagues were looking at different um, um, at continents and looking at zones and computing how much hydrogen has been produced there through serpentinization, through redolysis of water and other processes. And, you know, they get average values. So the average values they get is in the order of somewhere, you know, on my scale here, uh, 8 to uh, 10 to the 4 moles per second production of hydrogen. And what I'm showing you here is the model that I showed you before from Mars applied for the Earth, but in 1D. The problem is when we do this kind of models in 3D for the Earth, it gets a bit messy because, you know, plate tectonics is really a, um, I find a nice word for that, um, difficult to deal with sometimes. Uh, so it makes things more complicated in 3D. But what I want to show you is if you look at 1D studies, what we get is for hydrogen production, we get, this is time, or Earth's formation today, um, and this is assuming that we have a similar mode of plate tectonics as we have today throughout time, which might be wrong, but it's an assumption here. We see hydrogen production starting off, going down, and increasing very quickly in the first one to two billion years, uh, and then kind of like peaking off here. Now, this is today, and the cool thing is, you know, the predicted value for the model is kind of like, you know, right there where what we measure. That, that's kind of good because we know it's, it's, it's always, if that would be like a few more orders of magnitude off, it'd be bad, but it's only actually off by a factor of like 1, 1. 1, 2, 1, 2, 1. 5, which is really good. It shows us that there's some, you know, ground truth in that whole thing, how we're doing it. Uh, but what's really interesting is the time evolution because now we can start thinking a planet <coughs> doesn't produce, as we've seen also on Mars, you know, always the same gases. It evolves, you know, it cools down. Early on, maybe magmatic processes are more important than low temperature processes. And we can start thinking from an origin of life perspective, well, you know, if we maybe can produce hydrogen early on, if that's very low, because you see there's an increase in the first 1.5 billion years because of rapid cooling, if, if that example doesn't suffice to really drive, you know, a, a large biosphere, then maybe that's not really 
the primary nutrient that's so essential. Maybe we have to wait then. And what's really cool, and you know, that's a lot of people who are into uh, life started on Mars will love that. If you do the solving from Mars, this peak is shifted to about, you know, one billion years. So it starts already 500 million years after uh, Mars is formed because Mars is small and cools more quickly. So now that, that's something which shows us that some planets can do things earlier than other ones. We start to think, you know, as of planets like of like individuals that are in some way capable at different times to reach different things, different ages, different capabilities. And that's really fascinating, especially when you think about planetary systems and you know, how life maybe evolves in planetary systems or spreads. So what we see from that here is that Mars should be releasing hydrogen. And I see that I should keep going because I've been talking a lot. Um, and as I said, we can observe these kind of things, sample ExoMars TGO is an orbiter right now measure. Well, going to start to take good data about uh, fluctuations of like, some methane with limitations, but it's going to start doing that. And that is something we can start to connect to these models and see, are our models right? And what does it mean about the water availability or life? About methane, well, um, as I already said, methane is a bit more tricky, and it's much more tricky, especially people who you know, go into the field and deal with bugs and deal with the kind of like regions where methane might be produced abiotic or biotically. They know how difficult it is to understand uh, how, what the source of methane really is. And we try to use you know, many tools like clumped isotopes and other isotopologues, and it's even still very, very difficult to really figure out what the source, the origin source of methane is. But there's some interesting zones, and we, Part of my work is also connected to field work, to trying to figure out those, not just the geodynamical models and connection, but the, the processes. And example, just going to quickly go through this because there's not much time. Um, there's a zone in Northern California where um, it's, it's kind of like hidden, uh, where we're exploring, um, where we found very large concentrations of methane, about 95% of the gas bubbling out is methane. Um, and we are exploring the possibility, I'm gonna, what's right actually next to this train track, interestingly, because we figured out there was a mine over there. We couldn't find the mine. We were looking for it for like days. And later on figured out that actually that was the mine and they made a hotel on it now with the trains that were used to transport all the, uh, the chromium that, was got, that they got actually out of it to other places. But that's the interesting part of our field work. Um, but we're trying to explore really this, in this process what kind of catalysts are driving these reactions. Because that's important, If because catal catalysts are important. And we, example of Mars, we have an understanding example where we have you know, more metals or other metals. So if we know that, we can start thinking about also the potential of methane production on other planets and where they're occurring. Um, and what we're seeing over here, and that's very much research still in progress, uh, but we're seeing a strong correlation with most likely ruthenium that is helping to actually drive these catalytic reactions at very large pH. So the pH of this water is 12. People do water sampling, that's, that's very high. I know it puts your hand in there and it's really weird. Um, and we're st I find this place really fascinating because it's a from an astrobiological perspective, it's really interesting to explore it. Uh, a lot of people come there because if they call it holy water and they swim in it as well. Uh, but we are a bit careful because it, there might be actually elevated levels of hexavalent chromium, which is really not good. It makes you really feel bad over time and die, die young, so it's not good. So we want to make sure that it's not the holy waters are not too holy, because, you know, in a sense of like you're very quickly holy. Um, but so it's really interesting how you connect again, you know, profound science with preventing people from killing themselves. Really good things. Uh, <laughs> So we see as well, there are potentials of understanding how maybe Mars could generate methane, but this is really, 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 really work in progress. We're just starting to explore that, and this is part of a field campaign that is going to continue in the next few years. Um, now, I'm going to quickly tell you something really cool about oxygen. And we'll take like 10 minutes, and then I'm done with that. And before I do that, I'll have a sip of water. Because, uh, as we know, batteries you know, flow if we have uh, two different... Uh, potentials and now we're going to look a bit at oxygen and this is the, something I'm really excited about uh, and I've been working on this in the last one year and it was kind of like initially seen as a boundary condition and uh, and um, boundary condition to the kind of like hydrogen modeling so we try to understand okay we know how as a function of time we're learning hydrogen and methane being produced can we look you know at geophysical oxygen production but then we were like oh let's do it for Mars and we were motivated by this thing. You know, when we look at Mars, this is a picture of Mars from MSL. Um, let me just remind yourself what Mars looks like. Um, you know, it's 
very thin atmosphere, 6 millibar. Temperatures about like something like 140 to 3000 Kelvin. So it's really cold. And there's very little oxygen in the, in the, in the Martian atmosphere, about 0.146%. It's abiotically produced, uh, um, photochemically. And um, it's, you know, based on this, the, the current idea was Mars is, you know, very cold, not much atmosphere, not much oxygen. Oxygen is not really important in any way you know, to, to, as, as, a, as a working chemical agent for surface reactions and definitely not to be considered as important for anything related to life because there's nothing of it. There's so much CO2, you know, that's what you're going to deal with. But what was interesting is um, MSL, and this is Lanza papers, they found evidence of, uh, uh, of, of manganese oxides. And people who deal with the you know, early pre-GOE Earth, they know that manganese isn't really quickly getting easily oxidized. It takes a lot of oxygen, generally, and we don't find much evidence you know, of this before the GOE, the great oxygenation event. Uh, and, but we find it on Mars. People are like, what does that mean? Is it maybe tracked back to, uh, you know, um, kind of like um, evapor a, a, a process where hydrogen escapes and, and oxygen accumulates early on in some phases? Or, you know, I, I googled, like, I was initially interested in, like, oxygen on Mars. I, I realized there's a huge community out there that is convinced Mars has a thick oxygen atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And uh, NASA is hiding that from all of us. I cannot tell you the truth. Uh, but so it's a big, oxygen Mars seems to be in some communities a big thing. But now it became also in, in our community a big thing because like, how is that happening? And many people were thinking, well, so most likely there was more oxygen early on. Most likely, you know, Mars was much warmer. Uh, but we took another approach. We said like, okay, well, let's, let's just be a bit you know, down to Earth or down to Mars and ask ourselves the question, today, today's Mars. If we take you know, this little amount of oxygen in the atmosphere and we start asking ourselves a very simple question, we ask the question, is there anywhere on the surface, are there regions on the surface where water or brines, that means water plus some weird salts, could be liquid for a certain amount of time? The answer is yes. Specifically, if we're looking at brines, so we take you know, as is, Mars has a very large temperature variations on the surface and also variations over the year. It can be sometimes pretty warm, um, pretty warm, you know, a little bit about zero degrees Celsius. Uh, but it can be also very cold uh, and it varies very much locally, depending on the climate and the time of the year, you know, obliquity variation through time. But um, we know that there are brines on Mars. We've, we've, we've seen, we have evidence from, from, from measurements from Phoenix, from orbiters, uh, from MSL, which show us that there are brines that maybe, you know, let's look at different brines. We have brines that contain uh, calcium perchlorates, magnesium perchlorates, uh, you know, just normal salt, uh, sulfates, etc. So we can look at those brines and then say, okay, let's do at first a little game. And I'm going to just show you, it's, let's do a little game together. And we just focus first on this part of the chart. So it's easy to understand. Let's look at just one. What I'm showing you here is we're making a thought experiment. We're taking those different brines and we're saying, OK, why don't we assume, you know, we look at the average, uh, the distribution of temperature conditions on Mars. These are between something like 140 Kelvin to something like 290 Kelvin. That's it. That's the temperature conditions. They exist on Mars. Those brines exist on Mars. If we had these brines under these temperature conditions, uh, what would be the solubility, the dissolved amount of oxygen in those brines today on Mars? What's possible? Let's plot it from the minimal to the maximal values. And we do that and we say as well, we're just looking at normal liquids. Normal liquids means you know, when you cool down a liquid and it has salt inside, it will at one point freeze. So, it's frozen. The more, you have, the more salt you have and the specific kind of salt you have, the lower you can go and actually press this freezing temperature down. That's what you can do. That's why we have salt everywhere around here when we walk. 
not in California, but here. And you know, that's why cars look so bad. It's because the soil is put out to keep the water, the keep, do not prevent ice from forming, keep the, the brines liquid. And these brines have different freezing temperatures. Now we're just saying we're looking just at normal brines. So when we reach that normal freezing temperature, that's it, done. We're not going to look anything below that. It's just ice, frozen. And we look for these different brines. And what we see is we plot here in color, sometimes for water, then pink is for calcium perchlorate. Uh, this lighter pink is for magnesium perchlorate. Um, and we're looking then at the concentration of oxygen dissolved in this brine in mole per cubic meter in today's atmosphere. And we get values ranging from something to like 10 to minus, something below 10 to minus 5 mole per cubic meter to 10 to minus 4 mole per cubic meter. So we get a range. And we see as well in calcium perchlorates and magnesium perchlorates, we can get more. The reason why we can get more is because they have a very, very low freezing temperature. So you can really cool them down effectively very much. Now, we can do that. That's really cool. Um, and now we can compare this with this slide over here. This slide over here shows the limits known on the Earth for just normal bugs that like to breathe oxygen, aerobes. And the, one we, the, the lower limit we know for aerobic bugs is somewhere 10 to minus 6 mole per cubic meter. So all the values that are possible on Mars are about at least an order of magnitude larger than that, what some normal bugs need. That's cool. That means surprisingly, even today on Mars, uh, even without any crazy chemistry, whatever, we can show that theoretically there's enough oxygen dissolved in many of the brines that just normal earth bugs could breathe. There's other problems associated with these brines, but there's enough oxygen for breathing. Now we can go a bit more interesting chemistry and say, well, actually, there's been a lot of experiments, specifically for calcium magnesium perchlorates and these other ones, that show that these salt brines can actually supercool very effectively. Supercooling means once you reach the freezing point, you go actually to lower temperatures and that stuff still remains kind of liquid and there's a vivid gas exchange with the liquid. Um, even when you put in weird salts, some example for the calcium magnesium perchlorates, even when you include, there's been experiments where people even include Mars analog salts with uh, magnetite, etc., and they still super cool for very long times which is interesting. So let's say, okay, we consider the max, we take experiments and see what is the maximum supercooling and we include this phase space of supercooling as a liquid. When we do that, the solubilities can increase even more. So we can have super cool calcium and magnesium perchlorate brines where you can, and the question is if time scales are enough, but theoretically you can dissolve a lot of oxygen to concentrations which would even be comparable to the oceans to our, our ocean's concentration of oxygen with a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere, which we know is, you know, zero to fraction rate and a lot of uh, pressure. So what this tells us is Mars is much more interesting from an aerobic perspective than we ever thought. And now I'm going to quickly run through a few things uh, because now we can say, okay, theoretically we have a geochemical we have a model that tells us what are possible solubilities in brines for today on Mars and we see, wow, Mars is aerobically much more interesting. Now the question is, can we make a prediction locally? Now we can take a Mars climate model, and this is provided by uh, Michael Nishta from JPL, there's a Mars uh, GCM. Um, and we can look at, you know, example how the surface temperature and surface pressure vary on Mars as a function of time. These are our annual averages. And now we can say, okay, let's connect this with our solubility model. And what we get then, is actually, we can make predictions locally for where the potential of oxygen solubility is larger and where it's smaller. We can do it for the case where there's with supercooling and no supercooling. These are just normal liquids. And this is with the crazy liquids. But what's really cool, in both cases we see that depending on where you are on Mars, you can have a lot of oxygen dissolved and some very little. And it's mostly governed by temperature and pressure. If you go to colder areas, you can have dissolve much more oxygen. If you go to high pressure areas, you can dissolve very much oxygen as well. So the polar regions have much more solubility potential. Uh, the whole Tharsis region is not so good because the pressure is so low, although it can be very cold. So it's a, it's a, it's a competition between different zones. 
And that's really interesting because if you look at the landing sites of current missions, we see a variation of one order of magnitude depending on where things landed. So we can start to look at something really cool. We can start to get closer to understanding local measurements to the oxidation state today. But we can also do, and what we'd like to do is, to understand this as a function of time. Now Mars climate evolved, and of course we don't really know how it evolved, but what we can do is we can start thinking how maybe the Martian climate changed in the last like maybe 20 million years. So the Martian climate is mostly governed by obliquity variations. So the axis is, is very strongly varying. And we have, a, we can to some degree predict how it varied in the last 20 million years and how it's going to vary in the next 10 million years, the obliquity. If you go further away, it becomes very hard to predict because it becomes very chaotic. And then it just, you know, can't really say much. But when we do that, we can start to say, okay, if we know how, if we have an idea how the obliquity varied in the last 20 million years, we can see how the climate varied in the last 20 million years, assuming there's, you know, the same concentration of elements. Um, and we can there look how the solubilities changed on the planet as a function of time. And we get something really cool. What I show you over here is this is today. This is the solubility, the, the maximum solubility on the planet possible in calcium perchlorate borates as a function of time. We're here today here, going back in time, and what we see is about five, five million years and before, we have about uh, a potential that's about 100, 200 times smaller in dissolving oxygen in brines than today. And this simply has to do with the fact that we had actually much, uh, the obliquity phase was quite different in the last uh, five million years and before than it is actually five million years and today. But that's fascinating because we start to understand how obliquity can start to shape the potential of dissolving oxygen in brines. And unfortunately, you know, we can go only back 20 million years. But imagine if we can do these kind of things, you know, with modeling even more better climate, even further back in time, you know, even to the formation of the planet. Then we can start understanding what are local conditions or potentials for, you know, example, having oxygen-rich brines on Mars which back with the hydrogen calculation tells us where do we have power driving? Where do we have redox gradients? And, you know, I got to be really careful. In a sense, we've done this, you know, theoretical calculations. And I'm a, I'm a theoretical physicist, so, you know, I, I always say, um, you know, if we don't trust in theoretical physics, we don't want else to be trusted. Uh, I think, I wish politicians think, think like this. Um, because, you know, we're based on the laws of physics and we try to be as close as possible to those. And if we stick to those, then things are usually kind of right. But, you know, we make predictions and we look at things that are very low temperatures. And of course, I've learned as well from my experience, when you go to, you know, weird places, weird things happen. You know, there might be some surprises on the way, which we can't predict now. And nobody so far seems to have an argument saying why not. But we have to do experiments as well. And what we're doing right now at JPL, we're building up experiments on the way to look at the solubility of oxygen with, and the kinetics to see how it's really been dissolved at low temperatures and whether these predictions are right. But the good thing is, even in the worst case I've shown you, when we don't look at crazy liquids, there is still a lot of oxygen in brines that is much bigger than needed for organisms to breathe. So the conclusion remains, but we want to know what is really the order of magnitude. And for this, we need to have the experiments to really confirm in the future our theoretical predictions. So, Mars is theoretically, theoretically briefable, and we're going to see now what experiments show. So, that's been my little story, and I'm going to have a sip of water, and then I'm going to just tell you one little thing. So, I'd like to get, take, give you like three take-home messages. Um, or oh, actually four. First thing is, when we think about the origin and evolution of life, we have to think not just about the cell, but the ecosystem. And ecosystem, you know, is a relative word. Some people, you know, do ecology, think about a lake maybe. I think a whole planet. <laughs> but at the end, you know, that's, that's the environment. And one day in the future, most likely far future, but in the future, if, you know, we manage to still you know, survive, peacefully, uh, we'll hopefully be able to understand really from a general global planetary perspective to local scales how planetary systems evolve. It's going to be a complicated problem, a complex system, and there will most likely not be any definite answers. And therefore, when we do that, we need to have, we need to actually look at 
do a, a, a more a probabilistic approach. So I'm propagating in geophysics and in evolution that we have to do include probability. We can't just talk about, oh, this is how the planet evolved. That's what people did. This is how the planet evolved. There's too many uncertainties that we must include in our models. And therefore, what we can say is, this is a likely path the planet evolved, and this is the phase space of possibilities. And with it, within this phase space of probabilities, there are robust conclusions. That's the ones we should follow. And some, we just can't make prediction at the current time, dot. And as I've shown you, example for hydrogen production, we can start making some, we can say, oh, there's some interesting zones, guys. We should target those with robotic exploration, maybe, or with orbiters. Um, and there's a lot to learn still about separatization and fissure drop synthesis, a lot of theoretical you know, principles, what's driving them. And also, Mars is by far not anaerobic. It is an interesting place for aerobes today. So it's, it's something that is what I love about planetary, when we go to other planets, we are being challenged and confronted with throwing away our common assumptions because we're entering different you know, domains of pressure and temperature and things are different and we have to learn that to let go of what we've been taught and to look at the fundamental principles and trust those and take it from there. And then of course try to get experiments to verify them. But that's where really the really exciting and fundamentally uh, mind-altering conclusions then finally come. Now. I've, I've joined a JPL because, you know, the thing I'm doing, I'm trying to understand how plants evolve and co-evolve with life. But I also felt like I, I, know, I need data. We need data. And, uh, and I didn't just want to wait for data to come because I, I thought, you know, if you want something, you've got you to gotta help getting it. Otherwise, you don't deserve it. So in a sense of like, I mean, of course we deserve it, but we should put our energy in many ways how we want to get it. So there's many ways of doing that. But for me, I really wanted to help also get the missions so we can get this data. We can get that what we want to learn about other planets. And when you think about, you know, hydrogen production or the oxygen production, most of the secrets that, that we need to, most of the regions we need to access to learn about these things is the Martian subsurface. And in the last 40 plus years, you know, we have not really explored the Martian subsurface. And this has to do with the fact that, you know, you start, of course, first, you know, where you land, that's the surface, and usually you go deeper into it, which is we haven't really done it so far. And in the science community as well, there's been, um, uh, I think, a, a, a kind of idea going on that it's not possible. And what we are now actually showing, and I'll come in a second, that it is actually possible. It is possible to learn more about the subsurface, to sound better, to learn about volatile distributions, and also to drill. And that's not just important for our science, it's important for Mars also for you know, future plans of NASA and other companies to have actually one day, hopefully, you know, also humans on another planet. And so what we're example doing, showing like this is my last slide, um, already next week and one week from now, um, there will be the first KISS workshop called Mars X, Mars Subs Acceleration. It's, um, an incubator which we've built between JPL, SpaceX, uh, Honeybee Robotics, and Schlumberger. Um, important, please read that. Um, and so, no, I'm just joking. But the important part is uh, there's a great bunch of people who are really passionate about exploration and scientists who believe that if we really want to learn more about the Earth and Mars, we have to get data from the Martian subsurface. And we're trying to build a program in the 20s that will help us to really get data from the Martian subsurface. Um, and SpaceX has also joined the game because they, they want to go to Mars, showing here their promotion video, which is always beautiful. But we have, we're trying to build between, you know, think about collaboration between NASA, uh, other you know, industry partners, other space agencies from, from the Emirates, from India. Hopefully one day also China would be beautiful. Um, I know, I said hopefully, <laughs> uh, but um, that's not going to politically so work so well. Uh, but, but just to get in a way that we can really start answering the big questions and not just scratch the surface. So thank you very much and uh, please feel free to ask any question or shoot me an email. Thanks, Bob. That was great. So um, we have plenty of time for, for uh, questions from the audience. Yes, please. Cool. You both decide who wants to start first. Yeah, we'll we can fight later. 
Uh, so the question, the fact that that's very, that was amazingly interesting. I mean, the fact that <coughs> Mars is a, a oxygen reaching from a certain point of view, or could be, it's actually quite interesting from the biological standpoint. Mm -hmm. But uh, could you could you elaborate a little bit on the on the actual uh, biological or geological source of this oxygen? You said this as is photochemical, yes. Yes. But what exactly? What kind? Of, what? Uh, what? What? What kind of uh, photochemical reaction actually is the source of, or provides the source of this oxygen? Well, you, there's there's one person who could give you much more. I, I I'm happy to give you this information. There's one person who could give you much more detailed information about what how how Mars is generating actually oxygen photochemically. If you want later on. But who is that? Is this person? No, no, I'll, I'll tell you later. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the the thing is. Um, uh, it's, it's simply photochemistry. So what you have in that case, you have CO2 mostly, and you have water in small amounts. And what's releasing oxygen, uh, what's releasing hyd uh, water, uh, sorry, what's getting oxygen out of there is the reaction uh, of, 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 of a photochemical reaction that's releasing, splitting CO2 and water. There's hydrogen escape in this process, and oxygen is being stimulated. So there is stimulated. enough water uh, in the yes. atmosphere of Mars to generate this yes. amount of oxygen? Yes. It's very small amounts. It's super yeah, small okay, amounts. The thing is, what you have to see is, like in the atmosphere, we talk about yeah. minuscule amounts. That's why nobody really thought about it. But you have to understand the interesting thing is, when you look then at, at, at the sort of solubility in brines and equilibrium, um, there is, um, it's cold enough and high, you know, enough pressure that actually at these low temperatures you can dissolve oxygen well in those, in those brines. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's literally, you know, it's, 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 Nothing surprising if you really think about it. Yeah, apparently it's not. So but it is. It is surprising. I, 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 I mean, if we if he wasn't surprising, we wouldn't have thought about it. You know, it is surprising. Uh, but it's just because we're you know we're going we're used here to think about temperatures you know in the order of you know every experiment that's there goes to just a little bit above zero degrees Celsius. It's interesting. Even the experiments that that look at brines. They don't really look below zero degrees Celsius because somehow, I don't know, there's been some attitude in generally, you know, li anything related to life, you know, just it should be around zero. It shouldn't be much below that. So people just do all experiments, even if they think it's liquid down to, it's, I'm, I'm kind of amazed, you know, it's, it's kind of like, even if it's liquid, you know, down to 20 degrees, minus 20 degrees Celsius, people don't do, don't do measurements there. They're like, no, I'll stop here. They're like, no. Yeah, no, it, it's true. I think, um, there's been so much research done on extreme microbes that live in these environments, but I, I think the attention is probably 99% on uh, extreme high temperature organisms and maybe 1% on, on extreme low temperature psychrophiles. Yes. Although they are usually halophiles because the very low temperatures yeah. tend to have psych high salt concentrations exactly. on Earth. So we yeah. have very good model systems for studying this. Yeah. And that's the reason why kind of like, you know, we just didn't think about it initially. Please. Yeah, I have a little bit linked questions about uh, solubility versus the solid concentration. Yes, so you that's a good question. Do, do you, so you showed solubility in the graphs. Uh, so uh, does it actually mean solubility or does it mean the solid concentration? This is the solubility. So we're so doing right now. Don't, don't actually expect there to be that much oxygen. That's the m maximum amount that it could be theoretically. Yes, exactly. If you would somehow saturate it with oxygen. Exactly. Okay. And that's where the question of time scales comes in. So that's why, you know, we can make estimates about how quickly, you know, exchange should be. But that's the interesting thing, really, because now you have to start thinking about time scales on orders of hours that, you know, temperature variations on a daily scale and see is there enough time for things to exchange. And that's why we're also doing experiments to understand better than finally the kinetical aspects of this exchange process. But what's the expected like, saturation level? So how much of that solubility would be like used actually? So this the whole like thing, th you know, normally, normally this, <laughs> like, if you go to, you know, around, if you're in normal temperatures, it's, it's so fast. So yeah. your solubility is reached usually in, in normal states. If the, you have a little bit, because we're talking about surface areas, you know, it's direct surface exchange, it's, it's one layered. So that's immediately saturated. If you have a bit of mi mixing, you know, you can quickly, small degrees, saturate them completely. If you think about, you know, larger lakes or whatever, that's a big question, it's a big problem. I mean, of the Earth, we have that same situation. You know, we don't. We have only certain zones that are saturated. Uh, but for this, we really have to understand much more the kinetics now. Uh, at so theoretically, this could be reached. But in the no, this is really something that is to say. It's it's really something. You know, the first step is just the shocker saying, well, actually, it's possible. And now, and we can say where it's possible. Now it's a question where it is realized.
Yes, please. A very naive question. So what is the temperature fluctuation on the surface of Mars for each Mars day and Mars year? That's, that, that's exactly the same. That's a, that's a really good question. So in some zones, it can vary very strongly by, you know, I mean, if you talk about daily, daily scales, uh, it can be um, by tens of degrees, uh, Kelvin now, um, uh, varying. Um, and the annual scale, uh, it can be uh, significant. It can be also tens and tens of degrees that are varying. So um, there, there is a large variation. And, and the mean is somewhere between? The mean is, that's all things. See, the mean is, I mean, there's a, lo there's a large local variation on the annual mean already. Uh, the, the global mean is somewhere you know, around uh, minus, uh, minus 80 degrees Celsius, minus six, it's actually yes, minus 70 degrees Celsius. Um, most papers say minus 55, but it's kind of like based more on, the, <laughs> on the, the landing sites of the initial early missions, but it's actually cooler. Um, yes? So, an even more naive question. These are no naive questions, by the way. Um, These are good questions. What is, uh, in the, is there a large temperature gradient as you go radially inward into Mars? Like, is the core still sort of hot, or is it as, yeah, yeah. as cold as the exterior? Oh, it's big. It's definitely very hot. I mean, the thing is, and that's something maybe I should emphasize, interesting. When people talk, uh, many times I hear people saying, you know, oh, the Earth, you know, we know there's, you know, the, there's a hot core, maybe something like, you know, 6,000 degrees Celsius, and, and then we have, you know, clearly large gradients because we see volcanoes erupting and so on. Uh, the interior of Mars is, is, is hot, you know. We, we, we're going to have, you know, uh, maybe 2,000 degrees towards the, you know, r increase towards the core mantle boundary. Uh, it's, there's a lot of energy that is still, there's large thermal gradients. Um, and we also have convection in the Martian interior. It's, it's the scales, the spatial scales and the temperature scales are large enough to drive convection effectively in this planet. So there's large temperature gradients. And they're all the ones that are driving, you know, these local variations in heat flow, even today. Yes? That's really interesting. How, do, how, um, how have we measured the uh, temperature structure of the Martian interior? And how well do we know that? That's a very good question. So. Uh, you know, there's going to be one mission now landing or well, lifting off soon uh, in sight, and it will take one sample point. You put, you know, put a finger in there and measure temperature at one spot. Uh, and we can compare that one spot with our models. And so we need, we need much more data to be able to really validate that. Um, the thing is, um, you know, when we do our geophysical modeling of, 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 of Mars, and many people have done like you know complex 3D simulations or simplified ones. We see, and that's why I'm saying we can do simplified models, um, because Mars has this kind of like stagnant lid mode. Um, we we and, and it's not you know that it's still hot, but it's not that 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 hot. Um, but it's still very hot. Um, we see that the major thermal structure, you know, based on really simple physics, is going to be governed really by lithospheric thickness variation, um, and. And it's not like in the Earth where you maybe have some like you know plume rising. Look, there's there there as well, but they're not so dominantly you know perturbing globally the the, the heat flow. Therefore, from uh, you know from our understanding how planets function, we feel a bit more confident. I think that say okay, you know it's about really we will not you know we once we have also one measurement, it's it's very helpful to understand. What is the order of magnitude? You know, a surprising thing would be we take a measurement and it's like one order of magnitude different from our predictions. That would be fantastic, I guess, you know, because then really, you know, like, oh, it is, we got to really change something. Very exciting times ahead if that's happening, or maybe it's just an instrumental error. But, but so I think to, to answer your question, one measurement uh, and the simplicity of Mars helps us have more confidence in the predictions. Because the, the variability, the global variability on the Earth is because of planet tonics and this, you know, complicated, uh, very strong 3D variations, much more difficult to assess. So, you know, if the Earth, if you would land in one spot, <laughs> it would be very hard. But, you know, you know on, land on an ocean ridge or land somewhere in an you know, old craton, it's just like, it's, it's going to be very tough if you don't know where you really are. Yes? So, uh, on Earth, one of the low temperature environments that we isolate microbes from are uh, little occlusions of briny liquid water, say within um, uh, glaciers or, or within uh, sea ice mm -hmm. that uh, produce like a lot of these psychrophilic uh, organisms when it's cultured. Uh, so what's the possibility of finding little liquid water inclusions in the, in the ice caps due to local um, 
interactions of freezing and, and, and melting, concentrating salt in pockets that allow the water to be liquid. Is like, could we sample liquid brine pockets of water from Martian ice? Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm gonna, uh, there's no, there's actually, Theoretically, there should be good reasons to assume that this is possible and should occur. I mean, we know there's ice, you know, we see ice. Uh, we also have more and more indications. There was just recently also papers, some things have to be debated, but there's more indications that there's close to the surface still, you know, ice deposits that are there. We see it from excavated, you know, fresh, fresh craters, example. Water ice too, right? Water ice too. Water, yeah, water ice. Like, well, water ice here. We talk about H2O, and we know from you know spectroscopy and, and sampling that there's going to be they're most likely briny. So we do expect, you know, based on the temperature variation, that there will be definitely micropores where you might have liquid, you know, liquid state. Whether it's really there, I mean, there's no, nothing preventing it actually, um, but. Uh, it's it, that's an interesting thing, you know, because like Mars has this. It's kind of like two aspects. There's like this icy life, you know. There's a lot of ice, water ice, plus briny ice, where we can think about life today. There's also, of course, a potential still and of, of of liquid water, like a groundwater. And it's really hard to assess that. I, to be frank, if I would, you know, I've been asked often the question, uh, when you try to find liquid water on Mars, is it like you know drilling for water on the Earth or like drilling for oil on the Earth? Uh, theoretically, it's like drilling water on the Earth because you know where water should be based on temperature profiles and pressure and so on. But because of the 4.5 billion years of weird evolution and escape processes uh, and kind of like ice shielding and insulating, I don't know, to be fair. But there might be, theoretically, there should be enough, and there's also indications for, that there should be as a kind of liquid you know, groundwater, which is at much greater depth and can be for hundreds of meters to kilometers. Uh, which is a very different other habitat to think of, which is very tough for us because directly there's no, there's, there's, you know, there might be no evidence whatsoever on the surface of that. Some more questions? Yes. Okay. Uh, and this is great. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, so I have a question about the about the, the application of just this, mm -hmm. and please tell me if this is because of my uh, limited understanding. So Forget the limited could, understanding, just ask the question. So uh, could we reverse engineer this whole, this technique to uh, apply it to Earth? If you could just take data points everywhere and take millions and millions of them since we can walk around here, mm -hmm. and just like put all of them in and then hope to, uh, and then get a model based on those data points? So And if there's, and could we, yeah. So I, that's, that's a really good question, and it's a really good question for the reason I think, uh, f you know, I think Mars is the best opportunity to actually learn about fundamental processes. The Earth is really, really dirty. Uh, we have <laughs> there's so many bugs around here, so much life, and it's really, you know, for me, what's interesting to understand what the planet can do without life. That's what we have to know. Once we know really what the planet can do without life, we can understand if anything sign of life. On the Earth, life is everywhere. So if you even have you know measuring stations so on, it's so hard to figure out you know even the finest samples if there's really biology messing around directly or maybe some you know you know li biological matter from all times or if it's just geophysics and geochemistry. So that's why the Earth is so hard, and I think Mars might be a better tool in that way to actually start understanding things. And if Mars becomes even more, you know, if we, if we really start measuring and we, loc we because we don't have that, we have, we have local coverage, uh, maybe in the future we have smaller, smaller satellites, um, and if we have like 40 coverage, which means, you know, we, have, we know exactly when something is happening everywhere on the planet. Uh, if we then start seeing also confusing things, that's maybe even more exciting, because then we can say, oh, maybe that's, confusing often is indication that, you know, it's a hope for life. I would say. It's not an indication, but it's a hope for life. But it, it's, it's a problem. The Earth is too complicated in that way. And I think the Earth is really helpful from local sampling. So we really have to, I think, uh, having Mars and the Earth is really, a f we're really fortunate uh, for geochemical understandings. Uh, if we could do missions on the Venus, it would be great because then we had more understanding between tectonic processes. But Mars and Earth are really cool sample to understand geochemistry on a planetary scale. Welcome. Yes, please. Based on our, on our understanding of the soil right now, 
Has anybody tried to model, um, do a, 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 you know, a quick and dirty lab bench model of Martian soil and uh, the chemistry and so forth with, say, with, you know, anaerobic organisms? Yeah, people have been doing a lot of like uh, making, you know, taking kind of like Mars analog soil and, and trying to grow things on it and from, from, from bugs to plants to potatoes because potatoes are really cool now. Yeah, but, but I mean, in terms of uh, just basic bugs, in terms of, you yeah. know, um, does, so if we're talking, if we're taking that model, how far down do you think we need to go in order to, you know, how far would you take your, your probes down? You know, upon landing on the surface, how far down do you want to drill? To for, for biology reasons. For biology mean. reasons. So I, I would say my answer is I want to drill as much as I can drill. So I, the more you drill, the more you learn. Uh, but it, it's, I mean, there's a few aspects to that. One aspect is we, as I said, we, we really, you know, we, so far we really know the surface. Now when you know, Phoenix or MSL started scratching the surface, we saw this huge redox gradient, you know, change from like oxidizing red to, to grayish. Uh, very reducing environment, and that already is fascinating because we see there's a reduced potential building up, but we don't know what's below that. So um, the answer is we don't know. You know, the deeper we want, people from the astrobiology community will tell you we gotta go for certainly maybe a few meters uh, because of radiation. So you know, when you think about life and, and destruction of cells and also destruction of bio uh, of, of of bio indicators of molecules which indicate biological heritage, um, there's too much radiation that is uh, uh, damaging, so you have to be sheltered. Um, so they would, that's why ExoMars, the rover, it's gonna, should fly uh, 2020 uh, to, uh, to Mars. It also plans to, to drill you know, up to a few meters to go below this zone. Uh, but the thing is just, Ricky, we, we really don't know, you know. And I think the problem is, in many cases, what might, if we're thinking hunting for life or something like that, the limiting thing is really, av av I, I think, the availability of water. And the problem is in this whole thing, also when you think about experiments with bugs, um, and I think people you know, do experiments with bugs will tell you that much more about it. The problem is just, it's really hard to grow bugs in general. It, it's really hard. We can just do it with some specific ones. Uh, and because often they, they only survive in communities, that's why they survive, but we don't, we don't really know, it's a black box, what's right. really keeping alive. And then also, if you really want to do Martian conditions, you know, and you have to go to, you know, if you're close to the surface, you have to cool it down, and then of course you cool it down, they're so slow if they're doing anything at all, that we can't really measure it on a, on a PhD scale, you know. It's like, you know, these people will never graduate. So, so, so it's, 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 it's the hard part. So it's, it's really tricky at the end. What we try to do on Mars is we try to really understand from a 3D perspective what is the potential of different zones. And right now it's the potential, we're going to explore more what is the like, you know, get refined in time scales to have a better, not just surface but subsurface understanding. And we're developing in the same time much better sounding technologies to really understand on higher resolution, mostly from ground, what is the volatile distribution in the subsurface. And then we want to do ground truthing, which is drilling machines. You know, and there we are aiming nothing bigger than it's kind of like, you know, going to be able to really um, use the specific environment of Mars, which is quite different from the Earth, which gives us some advantages, which we can use for our purposes to get instruments down to, the, to use, you know, make measurements of astrobiological and geochemical relevance to a depth as deep as possible. Okay, so uh, are there any more questions? All right, well, let's thank Vlada again. Thank you all.